I've titled it this afternoon, In the Family, But Out of Favor. In the Family, But Out of Favor. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 20, and we're going to read about 12 or 13 verses through verse 32. Luke 15, 20 through 32. I'll put it up on the screen for those in the house of the Lord today. The King James text today reads, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meat that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Thank you, Master, today for the anointing in the presence of God that I already feel in the house of the Lord that I already feel on my spirit. Oh, my God, I feel a spirit of restoration. Master, today I feel a spirit of reconciliation. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, I feel today, Lord, the bone being drawn to bone and sinew, being drawn to sinew and flesh coming upon the bone as our God is going to restore life. 
life and breath to those, Master, who have been laid bare, those who have been utterly destroyed and cast out and set aside. Master, in the name of Jesus, send forth the Holy Ghost right now. There are some watching, Master, right now who have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, but they've been away from the church. They've been away from fellowship with you right now in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you would saturate their soul with this great Holy Ghost power. Touch them, Master, right now in the name of Jesus. Begin the work of healing. Begin the work of reconciliation. Begin the work of reconstruction right now. Reclaim the backslider. Bring home that one Lord which was lost in the name of Jesus. Oh Lord, hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Woo! I feel that God is doing something proactively. Glory hadn't even preached the message yet, and he's already doing the work. He's already doing what this message is going to demonstrate and what this message is going to lay out. Hallelujah. Oh, Master, in the name of Jesus. Anoint the speaker. Help me, Lord, to preach this message with Holy Ghost boldness and power. Oh, let the word of God go forth like a hammer and break the rock in pieces. Oh, Lord, that old stony ground, that old fallow ground today that has been hardened by hurt, by bruises, by wounds inflicted by other believers. In the name of Jesus, let the Holy Ghost right this minute begin to break up that ground and cause it to become cultivated ground. Lord, that it might receive the word of God and that that word might spring forth and grow and prosper and bring forth fruit unto righteousness in the life of the hearer. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Help this preacher to preach the word of God in the name of Jesus and help every hearer Master, right now, help every hearer to receive it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask it, O oh God, in that precious, saving, sacred name, Yeshua the Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. Hallelujah. Woo, I wasn't expecting that. Glory to God. I feel like God has already started doing what this message is going to articulate today. In recent years we have witnessed those of us who are Anglophiles, those of us who follow uh, the lives and <coughs> the activities of the British monarchy. I've always found it interesting. I love the tradition, I love the pageantry, I love the uh, pomp and circumstance associated with the monarchy, and uh, I've found it interesting to watch over the years, you know, and recently we watched as Prince Charles was officially coronated and became officially King Charles III, amen. And we have seen in recent times a split in the family. We have seen the two sons of King Charles, one who is dutiful and obedient and one who does everything in his power to please his father and to serve the monarchy. And good old Prince William, handsome kid. He's grown up to be a handsome kid. And he has that beautiful wife, Kate, and beautiful children. And my goodness, they just look like the picture of perfection, don't they? Even when they go out, I saw a little documentary recently online about how Kate uh, color coordinates her children with herself 
so that when they go out, you know, they always look just like a picture. I mean, they're absolutely beautiful. And her daughter has dresses that are similar hues or complementary colors to those that Kate is wearing. And what a picture of perfection there is. But then those of us who have watched have also seen as Prince Harry has fallen out of favor. And he's lost titles, he's lost privileges, he's lost rights. He's lost an awful lot for the sake of the love of his woman. And now we see where uh, there's one son who just seems to be doing everything in his power to make daddy happy. And then there's another son who seems to be doing everything in his power to break his daddy's heart and, and to cause disruption in the family and trouble. We read in our primary text today, Luke 15, the story of a man who had two sons. One son comes to him and says, I want my inheritance. I want what is ultimately to come to me, but I don't want it after daddy has died. I want it now. I want to tell you there are too many Christians today who are not happy to lay up treasures on the other side where dust and moth doth not corrupt and where thieves cannot come in to steal and to destroy. No, they don't want treasure in heaven. They want it now. They want it in the here. There is an entire movement and an entire false doctrine that they refer to as the prosperity message. And it is a false message, my friend. This entire message is Lucifer's attempt to convince believers that they can have it all in the here and now. They can have their inheritance now rather than have to wait. But God's people know that we have been called to a higher principle. We've been called to a higher standard. We have been called to think and view things spiritually. We understand that we, if heaven is real, if eternity is real, then why on earth would we have any problem at all laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven? Why would we have any trouble doing that if we honestly believe that heaven is real? Well, the problem is the prosperity doctrine appeals to the most carnal-minded and the most worldly thinking among us. People who profess to believe in Christ, people who profess to believe that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, people who profess that one day they understand our God will reward every man, every woman, every boy, every girl according to their works. People who profess to believe these things are being exposed, I'm going to say it plainly today, they're being exposed for the frauds they are. Because in reality, they are living their lives based on the most worldly and the most carnal of ideologies. And what is that ideology? You only go around once. You only live once, and therefore, you've got to enjoy, and you've got to live it up, and you've got to have a party every day, and you've got to have the best time in this life you can have, and you've got to accrue much as you can possibly accrue and possess as much as you can possibly possess and own as much as you can possibly own because you only get one trip in this life. But for the child of God, if our faith is real, that notion does not ring true. Amen. For the child of God, 
who has genuinely been born again, born again the Bible way, born of the water, born of the Spirit, for the child of God, we understand that this life is less than less than a dress rehearsal for the life that is yet to come. It's less than, honey, this can't be a dress rehearsal because the life to come is without ending. Hallelujah. So how could our measly 70 or 80 or 90 years here be a dress rehearsal for eternity? This is not even a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. But see, we have people who want to think carnally. They want to think in a worldly manner. They want to think like unbelievers think. And they want to function and they want to act like unbelievers act and like unbelievers function. That was the state of the one in our primary text today who is often referred to as the prodigal son. He wanted everything that he possibly was to inherit at a later date, but he wanted it now. Well, I'm going to tell you the biggest mistake that many believers today make is wanting to have now all that the Lord has promised us tomorrow. Carnal, worldly Christians want to make their lives in the world all that the Word of God says it will one day be. See, not only do we have carnal Christians who want to make their lives everything that God has promised tomorrow, but they also want to make the world what God has promised tomorrow. That's why we have Christians who are working feverishly in the realms of politics and in the realms of culture war and in the realms of law because they're trying to create some sort of a utopia here which Jesus Christ, the God of the ages, has promised that he will bring after he returns. Mm -hmm. But they don't want to wait. Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't want to wait for the Lord to come and fix everything. No, no, no. We don't like the wickedness and the evil in the world. You're full of crap. I'm going to say it as plain as I can say it, and the best word I know is C-R-A-P. You are full of crap. You don't like homosexuals. But you have no problem with greed. Oh my Lord, have mercy. You don't like sexual deviance. But you have no problem with selfishness. You don't like this group over there. But you have no problem in the world ignoring God's call to be hospitable and giving and caring and compassionate for those who seek asylum and those who desire to be part of your nation. Oh yeah, don't give me your garbage about how the evil in this world is an affront to you. You are full of garbage. You are liars from the pits of hell, every one of you. If you're listening to me today and you're one of those fools who runs around talking about how wicked the world is because of the gay folks and how wicked the world is because of these folks and how wicked the world is because of abortion, let me tell you, let me call your bluff. You are full of garbage. You are a lion sack of mud. You are pretty on the outside, as Jesus said, but inside you're full of dead men's bones because you're every bit as selfish. You're every bit as greedy. You're every bit as worldly. You're every bit as cutthroat as the worst of sinners among us. As a matter of fact, the greediest, the most cutthroat, the most selfish people in our society, you have come to worship and adore and admire. Yeah. So don't tell me how wickedness 
is an affront to you. You are a liar. God's true people, those that truly live in the Father's house, abhor selfishness. They abhor greediness. They believe in love. They believe in compassion. They believe in sharing. They believe in hospitality. Am I telling the truth today? Yes. The prosperity doctrine has flourished in this era and in this time in the history of the church. This is why the obsession of Christians in America with culture wars and political influence exists. One day the Lord has promised to return and establish his righteousness in the earth. At that time, believers will walk on streets of gold and live as kings and priests unto our God. But the biggest mistake a child of God can make is trying to realize today what God has promised us some near tomorrow. In our fervor to have it all today, we can wind up having even less than we could otherwise have. The prodigal son never stopped being his father's son. Did you hear me? He never stopped being his father's son. Even though he took his share of the inheritance and went out into the world and spent it on every sinful and ungodly and unnecessary thing, even though he literally reduced his life to ruin, even though he found himself so broke and so forth. Isn't it amazing how people can win the lottery today, win millions of dollars, and two, three, four years later, they are flat, busted, broke, and they are in a terrible financial fix. Isn't it amazing how that works? Because they take what they've won and they just splurge and they just spend it with reckless abandon. They give no thought to tomorrow. They don't invest. They don't do anything to provide for the long term. I'll tell you, a lot of Christians, that's how they live their lives. That's how they walk their spiritual walk. They're not investing anything for the long term. They're not doing anything to provide for the long term. And in the end, they wind up in ruin. I know people who have left the Christian church because they were suckered in to the prosperity message. And then before it was all said and done, in their desire and in their lust to have everything they could possibly have. Because after all, I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. And Kenneth Copeland tells me I should be able to have it all. Kenneth Hagen tells me I should be able to have it all. Jesse Duplantis tells me I should be able to have it all. They're liars. You need to wake up before you find yourself so broke you got to go out and get a job feeding pigs. And you haven't got enough money to pay for an apartment. And you haven't got enough money to have a house. And you barely can scrape up enough money to buy groceries. And you find yourself looking at the pig's food and thinking, hmm, that looks pretty good. I'm so hungry. I could eat what I'm given the pigs. That was the state of existence that the prodigal son found himself in. I want to tell you something. There are a lot of Christians today who have completely wrecked themselves. Oh, they kept believing all these lying false prophets who got on television and told them, oh, if you just keep giving, give, 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 give. Yeah, give, 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 give. And the Lord is going to bless you. God's going to turn it back on you. You're going to wind up with more than you can ever handle. Blah, blah, blah. 
and they gave, 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 and guess what? What the preacher said never materialized in their life. All that happened for them is they went broke. They lost their homes. They lost their cars. They couldn't buy groceries. They couldn't pay the rent because the message was a false message. Oh, but those preachers will tell you, no, no, the reason you didn't experience the blessing, it's on you. It's your fault you didn't experience the blessing. You see, if you'd have done it a different way, if you'd have done it with more faith, if you'd have done it this way or that way, you would have experienced. No, honey, it doesn't matter how you did it. The bottom line is the message itself is erroneous and false. It is based on the most worldly and carnal of premises. That premise being that God wants you to have it all in the here and now. No. Nowhere in the Word of God is that promised. In James chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, James, the brother of Jesus, writes... Ye lust, meaning you desire strongly, or you have a powerful desire, and have not. Ye kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war. How many people under the sound of my voice, every day of your life, it's dog eat dog. You are working yourself brainless. You're working yourself to death. To try to have it all. That's what James is talking about. He said, yet ye have not because ye ask not. You see, your source is not what your source ought to be. If there's anything I hate to see online, and I see it quite a bit, it is the humanist anti-God message. Listen to me. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Oh, I see. So the source of your prosperity and your blessing, the source of your advancement, the source of your increase is yourself, according to that doctrine, according to that mindset. But see, for the child of God, we understand, no, 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 no. Our source is above. Do you know why we tithe? Do you know why God's people give the first tenth of what they make in support of those who do the work of the ministry. Do you know why that is done? Look at the biblical record. Look at the example in Scripture why this is done. Primarily it is done as an expression of gratitude to God for providing you with what you have. That's the first purpose that we pay tithes. How many people are looking for every excuse under the sun not to have to tithe? How many people, oh, they'll, they will just hunt and search, and they will try to explain away the concept of tithing? Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, didn't he? Yes, he did. Why did he do so? He did so out of gratitude for what God had done for him. Tithing above all else, first and foremost, is an acknowledgement that God is real, and it is an acknowledgement that God is our source. Ooh, somebody sitting there saying, well, I've never heard that before. You just hit me with something new. I remember when I was a kid, I got me a paper route. I was so excited that I was going to be able to tithe. I was so excited that I was going to be able to pay tithes. It thrilled my soul to think 
that when the plate come around on Sunday, I was going to be able to put my 10% in and offer that to God as an offering, as a thank you, as an appreciation offering for his provision. I was so excited. Do you know what wound up happening to me, Tommy? Literally, literally. My paper route, <laughs> I started out with so many customers, you know, and all of a sudden, people all over my neighborhood started subscribing to the paper. Before too long, my, my, my subscriber list had grown enormous. Then I had the man who managed the paper boys come to me and say, listen, I've got another route this young man is quitting and I, it, it, it you know it goes off to one side of where your route goes goes down another street would you be interested in taking that on and I say yeah sure I'll take it on long story short by the time I gave up my paper route they had to give it to three different boys because it was huge and I had so many subscribers. My mother might remember on Sundays when the paper would come on Sunday and uh, they would deliver the inserts for the Sunday paper with all the coupons and all the comics, you know. And they would deliver that a lot of times like on Saturday evening. And then Sunday morning the paper would come and I'd have to stuff the inserts into all the papers. I had I don't know how many customers I had, but I had piles and piles and piles of newspapers. I used to have to take a bunch of papers and go down the street one way, come back to the house, get a bunch more papers, go up the street another way, deliver those, come back to the house, get a bunch of more papers, go up another road and deliver those papers because my paper route grew and grew and grew. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I believe with all my heart that that paper route grew and that opportunity was opened up to me to deliver more and more papers because I tithed. My first thought when I got paid was, thank you Jesus for this money that I've made. Thank you, Lord, for giving me an opportunity to make this money and giving me the strength to be able to do the job. Thank you, Lord, for helping me to accomplish this. And as a sign and a symbol of my appreciation, boop, there goes my 10%. And I never regretted, I still don't regret one nickel I've ever put into the church. I don't regret one penny I've ever paid in support of the kingdom of God because God's people think differently than the world. I know it's not all about having everything I can have here. I know there is a life yet to come that will so outshine this life. And I know, listen to me children, I know that not everybody on the other side of that chilly Jordan River is going to have the same number of trophies on their mantle, the same number of stars in their crown. They're not all going to have the same size house. Mm -mm. No. See, that's a mistake that a lot of Christians make. They think that because in this life, you know, there's been uh, disparity. Some have it all and some have nothing. They think because in this life, that's how things work. That in the life to come, everything's going to be level. Everything's going to be the same. Everything's going to be identical. All of us will have exactly what everybody else has. Oh, oh you could not be more wrong. You could not be more wrong. Let's read further today. The apostle, or excuse me, the Lord's brother said, 
Ye have not because ye ask not. You don't go to God as your source. You go to yourself as your source. And going to yourself, you're running around killing. You're running around fighting. You're running around warring. You're running around struggling constantly because you think that you are your own source. He said, but the reason you ultimately have not is because ye ask not. You're not going to the right source. He said, and when ye ask, he said, you receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your own lusts. He said, even some of you that go to God and talk to the Lord and ask Him for things, said all you do is ask Him for things that you want to consume and that, you know, the things you haven't just, oh Lord, I want a four by four. Oh Lord, I want this toy. Oh Lord, I want that toy. Oh Lord, I want, and, and your thinking and your priorities are so messed up. And guess what? God doesn't answer prayers like that. So you wonder why I pray and pray and pray and the Lord never gives me that Rolls Royce that I wanted. I'll tell you, I love Lincoln's. Lincoln is my favorite car maker. If Tommy will tell you, I'm always teasing him like crazy because he drives the Ford. Now Ford is made by Lincoln. <laughs> Notice I didn't say Lincoln is made by Ford. I said Ford is made by Lincoln. I love Lincoln's. I have loved Lincoln's ever since I was a kid. Not because they're, they're uh, a prestigious car. That's not why I love Lincoln's. I love them because ever since I was a kid, I've always thought they were the prettiest, the most beautiful cars. You know, I, I, we had a neighbor when I was growing up as a kid that used to drive a new Lincoln town car, and he traded it in about every two years or three years, and he'd get a brand new one, and every single one he got, his wife loved uh, aquamarine, you know, green-blue combo. She loved that aquamarine color. Every single one he got was custom-painted aquamarine. Ugliest thing, the color, to be honest. But when his big old boat Lincoln would drive up our road, you always knew, there goes Mr. Del Vecchio. <laughs> and that car was so pretty. I didn't care much for the color, but you know what? That was back in the day when cars were, the body, you know, style and everything, was just going, oh, it had that opera wind in the back. And I mean that big old boat with that big old front end and that beautiful grill. Oh, that fancy looking schmancy, you know. And then if you ever have the chance to ride in a Lincoln. Oh, 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 oh. oh it's like sitting in your living room on your recliner and you're just comfy and cozy and you're going over bumps in the road and you ain't feeling nothing. You're just floating over it. Oh, I, ever since I was a kid, I've just loved Lincoln's. Tommy and I were out shopping. I needed to get a new vehicle. I was going to get, what we were looking at was pickup trucks. F-150s. I was trying to see if I could find me a used F-150. We went to a number of dealerships. Finally, we went to this one dealership. And they happened to have a Lincoln Navigator, charcoal gray, just beautiful, sitting up there on the used car line. And boy, I mean, I looked at it and I said, oh, aren't they pretty, aren't they? I love those cars. Man, they're the prettiest. And it's the right size and it can do the same thing the pickup can do. I need a vehicle that can tow and uh, it can tow and what have you. And I looked at it and I thought, boy, it's beautiful, but I can't afford stuff like that. I, I, can't, I don't have the money for that kind of a car. But I went over, I was just curious. I went over and I looked at the price sticker on it, you know, and I looked at the price and I said to Tommy, I said, you won't believe this. He said, what? I said, 
this thing is the same price as the F-150s that I'm looking at. It's in the same price uh, area as the F-150s that I'm looking at. Now let me tell you, this preacher is not pretentious. I'm not ostentatious. I don't care. I don't give a flying fig about impressing anybody. What I care about is being comfortable in the vehicle that I drive and feeling good about, you know, what I'm driving. That's all I care about. So uh, I, I, I'm not trying to impress anybody. Long story short, we decided, well, you know what? Let's see what we can do on this Lincoln. And God gave me that Lincoln. Let me tell you a little secret, folks. Not one day of my life did I pray for that Lincoln, did I believe? I was never one day asking God to give me a Lincoln. I was never one day asking God, whatever the Lord gave me, that's what I drove. And I've been that way my whole life. There have been many times I was driving something that was a make or a model that wasn't at all my preference, but you know what? I was happy with it. You know why? Because God gave it to me. <laughs> Amen. There are times the Lord will bless us. There are times the Lord will give us the desires of our heart. But James goes on to say in James 4 and 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Folks, prosperity doctrine is friendship of the world. You can't call it anything but friendship with the world. Whosoever, James continues, therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. In 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 11, the Apostle Paul writes to his young apprentice Timothy, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Listen, supposing that gain is godliness, From such withdraw thyself. You ought to be avoiding any preacher or teacher gets up and tells you that the closer you get to God, the more you're going to have. And the more your earthly carnal lusts are going to be satisfied. And the more your worldly carnal desires are going to be met. Godliness and consumerism do not abide in the same space, my friend. But godliness, he says in Timoth, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts or desires, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. 
and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. I'll tell you, you can be a child of God and not be walking in the favor of our Father. You can be a child of God who is approaching things in a manner that is worldly and carnal and sinful and wicked. And I'm not talking about who you lay down with or who, who, what you drink or what you eat. No, I'm talking about what motivates you. I'm talking about why you get up and go to work every morning. See, I have to laugh. Uh, I was in the holiness movement. I know all kinds of holiness people got their hair piled this high, got their dresses down that low, and they are every bit as dog-eat-dog. -dog. They are every bit as much. I'll step on anybody I've got to step on to get where I'm trying to go and to have as much as I can have and to own as much as I can own as the next guy. And yet, like a bunch of foolish children, they have convinced themselves that they stand holy before God. No, you don't, sweetie. The Lord called you folks out when he said, you're like white sepulchers on the outside, you're pretty, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Everything inside of you is vulgar. Everything inside of you is sinful. Everything inside of you is worldly. Everything inside of you is carnal. So you can look the part till the cows come home. You may satisfy first UPC, but sweetie, if you think God doesn't see through your long hair and long sleeves, you're out of your mind. Too many people in the church or in the family, they believe the gospel. They sincerely believe the gospel. They sincerely obey the gospel. Many have been baptized in the name of the Lord. Many have received the Holy Ghost. But then they turn around and they embrace the mindset and the attitude. I want it all and I want it all now. I want everything this world has to offer me. In James chapter 2 verses 1 through 9, Again, the Lord's brother said, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come into your, unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme the worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. How many evangelical Christians in America today are worshiping a rich man? How many people see his wealth and his prosperity and his possessions 
as somehow being evidence of his abilities and his preparedness to serve as the chief executive of the United States of America. How many people look at the rich in this country and oh, they have the highest thoughts in the world of these people. I will tell you something, some of the people that I look up to the most in this life, some of the people that I admire beyond measure are people that I've known that didn't have a pot or a window as the old saying goes. Well, boy, I'm going to tell you something. They served the Lord with joy. They served the Lord with gladness. You didn't see any anger in them. You didn't see angst in them. You didn't see them running around uh, 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 complaining all the time. Somehow, someway, I look at my little great-grandmother. My little great-grandmother had arthritis in her body so bad that her little fingers were all, you know, bent up and little knots on her knuckles and all and I'm dealing with arthritis in my body now as I'm getting older and boy I'm gonna tell you it's painful and it's problematic and I look at my great grandmother and I think my God how in the world did that woman do it? She used to cook, she used to clean, she used to sew, she used to iron and I mean she was superb at all of these tasks. She did all these things and I never, 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 never heard her complain. Never. Not seldom. Never heard her. I wish, I wish I were more like my great grandmother. Her husband left her. Divorced her way back in the 1940s or the 1950s. She spent the entirety of the remainder of her lives until she was 89 years old and the Lord took her to glory. Spent the entire remainder of her life alone, single. She loved her children. She loved her grandchildren. She loved her great-grandchildren. She devoted her life to them. I never saw my grandmother one time say anything bad about my great-grandfather. Not one time. Never one time heard her call him a name. Never one time heard her accuse him of anything. And we know good and well what he did. The family knows what he did. And it wasn't good. But you know what? My grandmother lived her life. She didn't feel the need to run around belittling him and besmirching him and complaining about him and griping about him. Let me tell you something. I admire my great-grandmother more than I admire the richest man on this planet because I don't know very many people who could be like my grandmother. There are a lot of people who can have money, but there aren't a whole lot of people who can have arthritis so bad that their fingers are twisted and their fingers are knotted up and they still cook and they still clean and they still iron and they still sew and they still do all the things they need to do without a single word of complaint. The prodigal son finally realized the error of his way. He remembered just who he was. He was his father's son. Although he was away from home, that did not change his relationship. It doesn't matter how much distance King Charles puts between he and Prince Harry. It doesn't matter how much he withholds from Harry. It doesn't matter how many titles and privileges he withdraws from Prince Harry. The bottom line is Prince Harry will always be Prince Harry. He will always be the son of King Charles III. Nothing can change that. You can be in the family and yet still be out of favor.
he finally realized, the prodigal son finally realized that life at home was far better than simply trying to have it all in the here and in the now. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, the word of the Lord declares, Jesus speaking, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said, This know also that in the last days, perilous meaning life-threatening times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, meaning without self-control, fierce despisers of those that are good, Traitors, heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Paul was describing what was going to be happening within the church, not in the world, in the church having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof that is not descriptive of an unsafe world that is the church Paul said this is the degradation this is the vulgarity that you're going to see within Christendom as we draw closer to the end of this age all of these things will manifest themselves in those who call themselves believers in those who call themselves Christians he said from such turn away the Lord has promised to provide us our every need not our every want there are times in our journey that the Lord will indeed give us the desires of our heart as well. But those, inst those instances are determined by the state of our heart. When our first priority is the kingdom of God and his righteousness, our desires will always fall within godly parameters. Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. James 2, 15 and 16, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust or the desires thereof but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. In Psalm 37 and verse 4, the word of God declares, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Philippians 4, verses 9, uh, verse 19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches, in glory by Christ Jesus. According to a famous scientist many years ago by the name of Maslow, he created a table that is referred to as Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. 
You remember the word of God said, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Well, Maslow determined that humanity has a pyramid of needs. And that pyramid from the bottom up advances from physiological, meaning safety, to love and belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. I got news for you, honey. If you'll put first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he will provide not only for you physiologically, clothing and shelter and food, he will provide you with safety, he will provide you with love and belonging, he'll provide you with a spouse, he'll provide you with a partner, he'll provide you with somebody to help you carry your load, he will provide you with that which will build up your self-image and your self-esteem, and he will help you to realize your self-actualization. He will help you to realize the full realization of all that you can be. Because that's all part of what humanity needs. And the Apostle Paul told us, but my God shall supply all your need. All your need. Now, he, didn't, he didn't just talk about groceries and a roof over your head. No. All your needs. And we all need somebody to love us. We all need somebody to support us. We all need somebody to help us. We all need something that helps us to feel good about ourselves. We all want to realize our fullest potential no matter telling the truth. That's that's a human need. That's something that's built in to, to the human psyche. And the Apostle Paul said, our God shall supply all your need. Oh, hallelujah. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. See, when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then you're not asking for things that God wouldn't want you to have. You're not asking for things just simply so that you can have more toys or so that you can impress your neighbors or so that you can show up the guy down the road or you can do this or you can no 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 when you're seeking first the kingdom of God and its righteousness I'm going to tell you there have been many times in my life when I've asked the Lord especially when I was praying for a car and I'd say Lord help me to get a car hey, but I need something that has four doors I need something that can do this and that why because I bring groceries to people when they need food and I bring people to church when they need a ride so I need something that can accommodate all that you hear what I'm telling you now guess what God heard that prayer and he answered it hallelujah he didn't wind up giving me some little two door Toyota no he gave me something that met the need but my need was in line with his will so when I prayed and asked for it, I had no, no question in my mind that God would answer that prayer. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Got people who pray and pray and they listen to preachers. Oh, the secret to prayer. If I hear one more preacher try to say he knows the secret to getting God to answer your prayer, there is no secret to God answering your prayer, you imbecile. God isn't playing a game. He's not hiding from his people what is necessary to him answering the prayer. No. He's made it abundantly clear. 
If you will get in a mind that is not carnal and not worldly, if you will not love this world and be so concerned with this world, if you'll understand that you have a higher calling and you have something that I have asked you to, uh, to see that is above and beyond what this world has to offer, if you'll understand that and you will try to walk in my will and try to walk in my way, if you'll seek my path and let me me lead. I will lead you in some really nice places. John 15 verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Men and women find their lives in ruin as they struggle and strive to have more and more in this life. People want to have what they cannot afford. Parents destroy their relationships with their children as they pursue careers, wealth, success, position, and prosperity. Men and women lose their marriages to greed and ambition. If and when we learn to live in this life as God has called us to live, we will find that not only are our substantive needs met, but so too are our relationship and familiar or family needs. Our marriages and our relationships will prosper when we have our priorities right. Our families will be stronger and our children will grow up better equipped to survive and achieve when we have our priorities set according to the teaching of God's Word. Children, I want to tell you, like the prodigal son, he never stopped being the father's son. When he came home, the father didn't look at him and say, who are you? I don't know you. You're not part of my family anymore. Did he? Not at all. He was thrilled to see him return. Well, I'll tell you, there are people today, especially in the LGBT community, you've left the church, you've walked away from your relationship with God because somebody in the Father's household hurt you and wounded you and bruised you. But when are you going to wake up and realize that even the most subservient person in the household of our God, even the person who does the most, gives the most, has their needs met. And they don't have to struggle and strive and fight and war to get it. When are we going to come to our senses and recognize in my Father's house? Hallelujah. Everything I need is there. Oh, you can be in the family today and yet be out of favor. Favor is the place we ought to strive to occupy. It is a place of servitude and submission. You remember the older son said to his father, I've served you all this time. I've been here the whole time. I've done everything you ever asked me to do. Am I telling the truth? So it's a place. Oh, favor is a place of servitude. Oh, no, 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 Lord. Oh, preacher, you don't understand. I don't want to serve. I want to be served. Well, then uh, I got news for you. You're not going to be able to walk in the Father's household and be blessed. You're not going to be able to walk in the uh, favor of our God if your mindset is to be served rather than to serve. Jesus said the greatest among you will be the servant of all. Let me tell you, the place of favor is a place of proper priorities. It is a place of divine provision and perfect peace. But one must be spiritually mature and properly focused to walk in God's favor. 
We cannot walk self-willed and follow our own lusts and desires and expect that the Lord's favor will shine upon us. If you found yourself to be outside today of the Lord's favor, wake up, come to your senses. Realize today it's time to go back to your father's house where even those on the lowest levels of the household have all their needs met. That oldest son was jealous. Because his brother had a party being thrown for him when he came home safe and sound. And yet the father said to him, Son, all, listen to me, all that I have is thine. You've been living in a mansion, he's been sleeping with pigs. <laughs> You've been eating gourmet food, he's been eating pig's food. You've been working in fields and you've been overseeing the staff and yeah, you've been working and doing things and it's not always easy, but by the same token, at the end of the day you came home to a comfy bed. You never had to sleep in the cold and not have a covering that you could pull over yourself to warm up. You never one time reached for a pillow and could not find one to lay your head upon. Am I telling the truth? Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, there is something to walking in divine favor. I've told Tommy many times, he didn't grow up as I did in Pentecost. He didn't grow up understanding some of these principles that I understand today. But since we've been together, you have no idea how many times, I can't even count how many times, people have done things for us and given us things. People and businesses have given us discounts and given us freebies and, and handed us things. When I was driving Uber even, uh, I went into a, a fast food restaurant one time uh, to get a drink, you know, to buy, to, uh, or to use the restroom actually. And uh, whenever I would use a public restroom, I always buy something, you know, because I don't think it's fair to use somebody's facilities and not at least do business with them. So I went to the counter and I told the fellow, I said, whenever I use the public restroom, I always buy something. I said, so can you please give me a large, unsweet iced tea? And he handed me the tea and he said, it's on us. I just used his restroom. I was trying to pay the man back for using his facility. And yet he just hands me a tea and said, no, it's on us. He appreciated somebody that actually thought about at least doing business. But you know, I want to tell you, I cannot tell you, Tommy and I used to go into an Arby's in the Dallas area. We used to go into the, and this little girl, remember, every time we turn around, she'd be giving us this discount or that discount. And, book, and every single time we went in there, she waited on us. We wound up looking at our receipt afterwards and saying, you know what, look at this. She, she gave us a discount or she did this or she did it, you know. And uh, one time she said to the table, I had ordered a, I cheated, <laughs> diabetic, I'm not supposed to have those uh, uh, strawberry cream pies that they have, strawberry cheesecake pies, but I wanted one. And she sent four of them, remember that, to the table in the bag and said, here, said that. We, otherwise we'd have to throw them away. She said, but I know you like them, so here. How many times? I, I can't even count. If, if I were to try to add up over the course of a year, and it's already begun to happen here. It's called divine favor. Oh, 
I'm trying to do is walk in the will of God. All I'm trying to do is do things God's way. All I'm trying to do is abide in the Father's house. And if you're going to abide in the Father's house, like the old saying goes, my house, my rules. <laughs> How many of us, right, had dad or mom say that to us? My house, my rules. Well, I got news for you. If you're going to abide in the Father's house, you're going to be expected to abide by the Father's rules, and I tell the truth. But the wonderful thing about our God, the wonderful thing about our Father, He is not a taskmaster, nor is He an authoritarian. He offers us constant, loving, wise counsel and advice, and if we'll take it, we can live our best life and we can walk in divine favor because there is nothing worse in this world than being in the family but out of favor. Amen.